One of the problems that we see is that people just, you know, you're not generally dealing with drugs that have a controlled dose. I think you're pretty cool, Andrew. Yeah. Thank you. I Thank like you your job. vibes. And, All right. and, Listen, and, if I was getting loaded, I totally would come to your treatment center. There you go. I dig your vibes. There we Let's go. Let's do that again. <laughs> we help just not the addict, but the whole family. We help them navigate I'm through the, the process. And then we really, really, after treatment, we realize that treatment is just the beginning. I'd urge you to come with me and get the help that you need to be able to address your daughter's issues and come from a position of strength and really a parental role where you can really help your daughter. And can we April can go that. with you right now? Absolutely. We can get in the April, car, go, go straight to our facility. Go. You know, you see multi-general addiction where families believe that excessive use of drugs or alcohol is a normal way of living. I, I, I got sober in 68, I got out of the pen in 69. So the hardest year for me was getting sober in the pen because everybody knew I got loaded. Everybody knew I dealt drugs. Everybody knew I was a bad guy. And all of a sudden I'm trying to, you know. Be so it guy. was harder in, in the joint, you know. Huh. And then when I came out, it was like, wow. I just, you know, I, I loved, it. first of all, just about being free. When I was shooting a reality show and I had cameras on me all the time and I had a substance abuse problem, it got exponentially worse because I felt that I, I had to keep this, uh, I had to keep it all together and I had to, to be something, but inside I was tortured. Quick yeah. fame and then not being able to handle it and then the disappointment of not being able to handle it and the rejection and the failure, it's a lot. And then, you know, people obviously go back to self-medicating um, and if they already have a problem with addiction, it just escalates sometimes. We never talked about the mental component, but because of uh, people in the limelight coming out and, and saying, I've got this, I'm dealing with it, uh, I, I, can, I can have a, a good life. 80% of, uh, of mental disease is, is uh, fixable. The truth of the matter is that most people don't see the really sort of extreme reactions that people have to long-term or excessive drug addiction. Addiction is a disease and it's rampant. Can we educate, can we warn that a lot of people will never be able to control this? Well, at first, I think you're absolutely right that most counselors believe that uh, marijuana is the gateway drug. Um, ironically, I think it's because they overlook the legalization of alcohol and tobacco, mm. which really are truly the largest gateway drugs and cause the most damage in our society. Tricky things with addiction is often you'll see it skips a generation. It's not that it's really skipping a generation because there are a lot of genetic markers that show that people are predisposed to addiction in a the family. There's a lot of addicts that come to for treatment and most of the trauma we deal with is, you know, their mother left, their father left, they were abandoned, they didn't have any support or resources, there's no one there to help them with their education. So as a treatment professional, in some ways I'm in a little bit of a hard spot because I want, I don't want them to think that they can just go do whatever they want and there's a quick easy detox for it to get back off. But the reality is there is that. But I also don't want to punish them for their drug use, which when I'm really trying to help them and give them a life that they can, that's sustainable. You know, a lot of people talk about relapse and that their behavior relapses before they relapse. What are some warning signs you could give people that they're not, not on the right track? You're not talking to another human being. A lot of that drug addict behavior that you're describing and the stereotypical types of behavior that go along with each drug, mm -hmm. that is the identity that they right. form because they've been using for so long and they're stunted. And what we see is when people actually get sober, that then all of a sudden they have to go back and start from where they left off and figuring out who and what they were, what they're really interested in. It's just one of these cases that just keeps going on and on. And the sensationalism by the sheriff's department uh, is a little disturbing. Um, most importantly, I think we need to really Really understand what happened. Perpetrators' families are ignored in these situations, and uh, you know we're talking about trying to break a cycle of violence. We have all these things happening in society, and nobody's doing anything about like trying to figure out really why these things happen and what we can do about them. They had managed to break the cycle of violent and uh, abusive relationships, but Jim was very stoic and. Um, always held all those emotions back. A lot of patients, especially when I worked more just in acute care psychiatric hospitals um, than in rehabs and the work that I do now, but um, a lot of people would adopt their diagnosis. So uh -huh. it was very, I thought, dangerous to actually even let people know what they were diagnosed with often because they would then go, you know, look up what that was and then they would start adopting the characteristics or they'd say, oh, because I have borderline personality disorder, it's okay for me to like, you know, try and stab my spouse. People don't develop these senses of uh, 
uh, entitlement and um, or, or lack of um, ability to cope with from fame nowhere, or yeah. from nowhere. It right. comes from it comes from a lack of guidance and a lack of. Uh, you know, people putting the proper controls on you and really having your best interest in art. And so we I, like to I make look s- back oh. quite often at my son's life and like I think about well when you know, when he was fourteen, I think about what was I doing at fourteen? Right. And then I go, Oh my god, I'm breaking the cycle of neglect, abuse and addiction in my own family. Yeah. You see all all kinds in yeah, our this is a, you know, addiction doesn't discriminate against anyone. It's something that we're seeing. It's very, very pervasive in any walk of life. Um, even, you know, poverty even actually doesn't produce that many more alcoholics than wealthy people. That message has to be out there as well, that there is hope for you to represent morally and ethically and intellectually who you are now that you're sober and have that be of value and give that to other people. (laughs) 